good evening, everyone. Uh, I'm K.S. Narayan. Uh, I welcome you all on behalf of the IIT Alumni Center Bengaluru for this 58th webinar. Uh, we have been conducting this webinar uh, series online since April 2020. Uh, it's really been a successful series. And in case you have missed it, uh, you can find a previous webinars on our YouTube channel. We normally have these uh, webinar lectures on Saturday twice a month, uh, typically at five in the evening. Uh, and uh, I'm joined in here by Dr. Sushila Venkatraman of the IIT ACB, who has been the major driver for these webinar series. Uh, today, we launch uh, the IIT ACB launch, launches a new series in partnership with Infosys Science Foundation. The Infosys Science Foundation was established in 2009 with the stated purpose of elevating the prestige of research in India. The foundation gives the Infosys Prize for path-breaking research by Indian researchers in six categories. Uh, in addition to the prize, the foundation aims to collaborate with uh, academic institutions to disseminate scientific knowledge as part of its objective of inspiring future generation of researchers, as well as driving conversations around science and research. Uh, the collaboration with IIT ACB is part of this endeavor. Uh, and for today's special event, launching the series, we have Professor Navkant Bhatt and uh, Dr. Chandrasekhar Nair. Chandrasekhar Nair, who is going to tell us about the importance of affordable healthcare and how this challenge can be addressed in India. Uh, moderating this discussion will be Dr. Dhananjay Bindukuri. Uh, Professor Navkant Bhatt, uh, is, uh, is the Dean of the Division of Interdisciplinary Sciences and Professor at uh, the Center for Nanoscience and Engineering at IASC Bangalore. Uh, Professor Bhatt received his PhD in Electrical Engineering from Stanford. And before that, he had an MTech from IIT Bombay and a B from SJC in Mysore. Uh, his uh, research focuses on the nanoscale transistor devices and on novel materials for creating new robust, inexpensive and low power sensor devices and systems. Uh, he is a recipient of many awards. Uh, Professor Butt uh, won the Infosys Prize in 2018. He is also the founder of Path Shows Healthcare Private Limited, which was incubated at Sense IAC Bangalore. Uh, joining him is uh, Dr. Chandrasekhar Nair, who is the co-founder and CEO of Mall Bio Diagnostics, a healthcare company in, uh, in the in vitro diagnostics segment. Uh, Dr. Nair completed his B and his ME from Bits Pilani. And then he also has a PhD from BIT. Uh, he has developed and commercialized true TrueNAT, uh, a new point of care testing platform for PCR-based uh, medical diagnostics. Dr. Nair's work has enabled testing for millions of COVID-19 cases across resource-limited settings in India and the diagnosis of multiple infectious diseases, including tuberculosis uh, all, all over the world. Uh, he's the 2021 Infosys Prize winner. Uh, in the engineering and computer science category. Uh, moderating this discussion is uh, Dr. Uh, Dhananjaya Dendukuri, who is the CEO and co-founder of uh, Achira Lab, Private Limited. Uh, Dr. Dhananjaya has his PhD in chemical engineering from MIT. Uh, prior to that, uh, he had got his uh, master's in, uh, from the University of Toronto, and he is an alumni uh, of uh, IIT Madras. Uh, Dhananjay has pioneered cutting edge technologies in microfluidics for medical devices and diagnostics in an industrial environment. So we really look forward to this uh, lively web, web discussion and uh, chat. And I would uh, really encourage the audience to participate in this discussion via que uh, questions uh, uh, you can uh, post in the Q&A box, okay? not the chat box, and uh, Dr. Dhananjay will be moderating those questions. Uh, 
Uh, with that, uh, I'll hand it over to Dhananjay. Okay, thank you. Thank you all. Uh, thank you for the very kind introductions and uh, welcome you all to this really exciting session, affordable uh, diagnostics uh, in, within the healthcare space. We have two excellent panelists uh, with us that cover the range from cutting edge academic research to commercialization, translation at scale. So I think there's a lot of things that we will learn from them today. And although there's a limited amount of time available, we're hoping to cover a few different uh, points, starting with their personal journeys, what they've done. Uh, also look at what the path of innovation is, because today we're focused on, I would say, innovation, science and technology-driven businesses in diagnostics. That's really sort of the larger uh, thing that we're talking about today. So what does it take to translate some of these to market? Uh, what are some of the unmet needs in the Indian diagnostic space? Where should we be looking to in the future? And finally, maybe some learnings that they've all had through their impressive journey over the last uh, many years. So I will kick it off with um, actually asking uh, Dr. Navkant Bhatt to talk about his journey a little bit. And as already mentioned, he's be, he wears two hats. He's both an academic with an impressive record, and he's also started a company that's in this point of care diagnostic space. In addition, the Indian Institute of Science, we believe, is doing some very exciting things in the interdisciplinary uh, fields of biomedical engineering, medicine, etc. So I'll start with asking uh, Dr. Butt to talk a little bit about his own journey. Over to you, Dr. Butt. Yeah, thanks very much, uh, Dr. Dhananjay. It's a pleasure to be part of this uh, you know, uh, panel, uh, both friends, Dhananjay and uh, Chandi. Uh, it's good to be with you. And uh, let me just use some slides so that, you know, uh, I will bring some uh, focus to my discussion. Uh, I hope the presentation is visible. Uh, can you see my slide? Yeah, yeah, yes. Excellent, excellent. So I have uh, titled this as Nurturing Interdisciplinarity for Affordable Healthcare. I will begin with uh, my own story uh, with just one slide, uh, giving the, the journey that I have gone through. And then uh, as uh, Dhananjay pointed out, uh, you know, uh, we are actually trying to uh, bring together uh, a stronger uh, confluence of uh, different uh, fields to enable this interdisciplinarity at IASC, uh, led by our director, Professor Rangarajan. I will also talk a little more about that. Uh, so, Particularly, you know, I started uh, looking at this uh, area of uh, uh, affordable diagnostics uh, early 2000. Uh, the, the goal that I had back then was really to uh, look at uh, non-communicable diseases in particular, right? Uh, such as, you know, diabetes and its complications, anemia and malnutrition and so on and so forth. And the idea was really to uh, see whether uh, you know we can build a, a point of care device which would be able to do many tests on a single platform, right? And uh, you know that requires uh, very highly interdisciplinary work. And you know we fortunately had our clinical connect through Dr. Krishna Swami and uh, a couple of generations of uh, smart, bright PhD students. I had the opportunity of working with them, uh, Dr. Shivram Krishna, who is now a faculty at IIT Hyderabad, and uh, Vinay Kumar, who is actually now CEO of uh, Patshod Healthcare. By 2015, um, you know, we had come up with very interesting technologies and multiple international patents. So we thought it's time perhaps to think about translating because oftentimes, you know, valley of death <laughs> will, uh, you know, not enable these translation to happen. So. Uh, we thought the best is really for the inventors to really take it forward, right? So that is how we incubated the startup, worked very closely with the clinical collaborators and eventually uh, brought out this product, which we call Lab on a Palm, uh, uh, which is called Anupath, uh, you know, uh, which does multiple tests. And we have had uh, many successes in terms of its deployment and uh, COVID has been a pain in the last couple of years, a uh, lot of issues with supply chain. Uh, but nonetheless, you know, we're, now we are trying to sort of uh, scale up very substantially. Uh, we could also pivot during COVID and also uh, incorporate uh, COVID antibody test on the same platform. And, uh, 
you know, uh, right now this uh, product is in use in 12 different states and it has touched close to 50,000 uh, patients uh, in the last count. So, so it has been a very, very, you know, exciting journey so far. Uh, now, we want this kind of, uh, you know, uh, in innovation uh, to come up exponentially, right, in a very large number. That is where we need institutional mechanisms, right? And uh, it has to be very, very interdisciplinary, highly interdisciplinary. And if you look at the global healthcare trend, there is convergence of all fields onto healthcare, nanotechnology, you know, molecular imaging and biology, AI, ML, you know, uh, converging onto healthcare. That's a big thing. And also in terms of healthcare delivery, there are new models emerging. You know, the focus is shifting from disease centric to, you know, making sure that there is home care and you ensure that there is a, you know, long term uh, uh, homeostasis of being in good health, right? really not going to disease and trying to treat a person. But really, there is a, there is a big issue in equity of healthcare. Uh, there's a big healthcare divide. There's a bottom of pyramid, uh, which really uh, needs to be served. And I think that is where affordable healthcare will, will really uh, play a very, very important role going forward, right? Um, so this is where uh, we at IASC, as I said, uh, uh, as soon as uh, Professor Rangarajan took over as director, he uh, brought this idea that we should uh, really have this uh, postgraduate medical school in IASC, which is very common if you look in the West, whether it is Harvard, Stanford, Johns Hopkins, you know, Tor University of Toronto, right? Many, many examples. They really enable seamless integration of clinical practice and laboratory research, which enables in creating physician scientists and medical technologists. And I'll give you just one slide, uh, the subsequent slide, which will tell you the kind of innovations that have come out because of this kind of interdisciplinary emphasis. And really, I'll, I'll give you this example of Stanford because you know I know how things evolved there. Uh, Stanford Med School was in San Francisco, but they thought that the co-location is extremely important. They then moved it to Palo Alto, right? And in fact, you know this is what uh, uh, Brian Kobilka, who is a you know Nobel Prize winner, says: Stanford Med School is a special place where students have access to cutting-edge research because it's a great university, and also because the basic science departments and undergraduate campus are all contained in a very small geographic footprint. This is what we are trying to address. And if you can do something like this, you know, the kind of innovations have, that have come out in healthcare from each of these plays is phenomenal, right? Uh, you can read some of these uh, insulin, for example, from University of Toronto, Johns Hopkins, implantable, rechargeable pacemakers, cochlear implant from Stanford, and so on and so forth, right? A very, very large number of healthcare innovations uh, which have transformed the way we live today, right? And at IASC, we have been focusing on cross-disciplinary research in the last decade or so. Uh, this has been, uh, you know, uh, something that is cooking. Uh, things like, you know, brain computation and data science. There is now Center for Brain Research, funded by Chris Gopalkrishnan quantum technologies, a lot of work happening in cancer research, you know, sensors, the example that I gave you from my research, biomedical systems, vaccines and drug discovery, which is also becoming extremely important with COVID uh, in the recent past. And eventually what we believe digital health will really uh, be extremely important uh, intervention going forward. So we believe that this IIC postgraduate medical school will become a new frontier integrating not just basic science and engineering, but also bringing in clinical sciences. And uh, this would be really important, uh, you know, to enable affordable healthcare for all. And one of the, uh, I'll skip some of one of the slide. This is how this hospital is coming up. Uh, we have just started uh, the construction right now. And a critical enabler is really interdisciplinary training. For example, MD-PhD is an interdisciplinary program that we have envisioned where students go back between clinic and the labs, both engineering and science lab, and they submit a single thesis to get both MD and PhD degree. And similarly, we are also planning many dual degree programs in order to have cross-disciplinary training of students going forward. So let me pause here, over to you, Dhananji. Thank you, Navkant. And a very exciting to hear about both your own work as well as all of the things that are cooking at ISC, 
And I think, uh, you know, we've all seen places like the Boston and the Bay Area and so on. And if we want that kind of vibrancy, we really need a very strong connection of clinic to research. And I think uh, I'm, we're all really hoping that ISC Medical Center will be able to pull off things like this and much more in the coming years. Now, <clears throat> moving to Chandi. Uh, Chandi, your story, Malbio story, has been quite inspirational and unique in the Indian context in terms of actually taking a new platform technology all the way from ideation to very significant scale and clinical impact all over the country and even abroad. Um, so I'm sure our viewers would love to hear more about your story, your journey, and what it's taken you and the team to get to this point. Over to you. Thank you, Dhanijay. It's um, an absolute pleasure being here and uh, inspired by Naukant. Let me also share one slide that kind of encapsulates our uh, uh, very long journey. Um, just to put things in context, we started as Big Tech Labs in the year 2000. And uh, we started with an idea that we had insufficient diagnostics today in clinical practice. Or clinicians did not have access to a diagnostic technique. Much of it was based on um, kind of a pattern recognition and it depended on the, uh, on the clinician. So we actually started off uh, on uh, NCDs. We started with glucose sensing and we did not know that the clinical use case was as important as anything else. So we, we started out to build a very sensitive glucose sensor. We did a lot of work in that area, in, in the MEMS area, and um, came up with a few challenges. The challenges were that of how do you actually translate a design into a product? The second was, if you do that, will you be allowed to sell it? And what is the freedom to operate? The third was, what is the competing technology and why is it that it is priced at that level? And what would happen if a different product came out of the market, etc.? Based on some of our um, early disappointing learnings in that area, we decided to switch and we decided to work on PCR. As an engineer myself, I was super excited about this technique that we used to use in the lab uh, because this was among the few techniques that gave us very high sensitivity coupled with very high specificity. And uh, we believed that if we were able to create a platform that could be used at point of care and do PCR at point of care, then it was a no-brainer, isn't it? That, okay, we could uh, definitely come up with very very, very uh, specific diagnostics and allow a directed therapy to follow that would allow the patient to recover very quickly, preventing spread of disease and faster return to wellness for the patient. It was easier said than done. Uh, we started working on that area. We had to create a team that knew how to work together, uh, a team con uh, consisting of engineers and, uh, let us say, biologists, chemists, etc., and we came up with our first proto uh, in Professor Venkatraman's lab at IISC in 2005. Between 2000 and 2005 was a very interesting journey where we were trying to get funded. Uh, the way we started was a bunch of four of us decided that we want to work in this area. Three of them were from the IT area. And they had the ability to generate some resources. And I had the ability to spend it. So uh, we were always kind of um, not very comfortable in terms of our funding uh, situation. And we were looking towards the funding agencies in the government. And unlike today, the government did not know how to handle us uh, because we were a private enterprise. And I have had so many instances where some of the best minds in the country have uh, approved projects that we had put up but the government was not able to fund it. In 2005, though, the Nimitli program, the new Millennium India Technology Leadership Initiative program, saw this very early prototype that we had put up and decided to put a fantastic team together to help us achieve this. They gave us a soft loan. It was not a grant. And we got the soft loan because we had a, a revenue stream coming from IT. That allowed us to start working on the technology with 
people like Professor Padmanabh and Professor Ganguly, uh, Professor Mohan Rao, and all of the others as part of our um, advisory and monitoring committees. And I must tell you that that was, I think, the most exciting time in our journey because we didn't hear a word of negativity. We only heard encouragement. Everything that we presented was applauded. And that kind of um, galvanized the team to work very aggressively to address this problem bit by bit. So what were the problems? The problem was, first of all, that we needed a very fast reaction. So we decided to shrink the thermal cycler itself. And the thermal cycler was uh, shrunk to a chip. Uh, let me see whether I can get a pointer. Yeah. This is the chip I'm talking about. This was a low temperature co-fired ceramic chip. And this came about because we did not want to work in silicon anymore, considering the difficulties that we had in our early journey to work with the silicon fab. The advantage of this uh, was that I could um, very quickly ramp uh, temperatures. So I could heal, heat quickly, I could cool quickly. It was a biocompatible surface. And the rest of it was only instrumentation. Then I had to develop the, uh, or the team had to develop the electronics and um, the optics that would pick up the signal. Uh, we went with Tacman chemistry because that was proven. And we started coming up with multiple prototypes. Uh, each one of these that you can see here um, is not really arranged in a sequence, was almost a year's effort. And I believe that that was suboptimal. In hindsight, I believe that we should have done this much, much faster. Finally, after uh, quite a few iterations, uh, we came to a situation where we had H1N1, the first outbreak, and we had a device that we could actually deploy in the field. And we could get live data from the field. So one of the things that we learned very early on is because if you if you want a point of care device, this device will have to take care of biosafety. So we developed a media that would allow the sample collection to ensure that the sample is biosafe. We also developed a PrEP, which was a battery operated PrEP. We realized that this PrEP was very good, it gave excellent quality uh, total nucleic acids but it tied an operator down to this device and we don't have that many operators in the uh, uh, clinical diagnostics area so we moved to an automated method so this is our automated prep and finally came up with a device that has prep pcr printer everything in one box this as you can see has been a multi um, agency multi-year journey with multiple parts of the entire ecosystem working uh, or supporting us uh, very extensively. And in 2020, we finally got our WHO approval for our TB test, which was a point of care smear replacement test. Smear uh, has a limit of detection, um, which is, uh, very high and therefore if you go for smear microscopy you possibly are already suffering from tuberculosis for about six months our test with the molecular test you are able to come down to uh, the low tens or hundreds of copies so in about two to three weeks of cough you should be able to pick up tb therefore that early diagnosis really helps in starting the right directed therapy and preventing spread of the disease. It, it helps very rapidly in terms of recovery also if the right therapy is given. TB is just one example. Today our platform can test 40 different um, pathogens and at any point in time the R&D team is working on 30 to 40 other tests on this platform. This has been a snapshot of our journey. Uh, I'll pause here and over to you then Jay. Thank you, Chandy. And on a lighter note, I don't know, you know, we all, all of us who are developing things like this, we know it's two steps forward and one step back. So I thought maybe the fact that your sequence was not actually in sequence was trying to show uh, that as well. But, uh, you know, uh, we understand it's been a very um, difficult journey, but supported, it seems like at important times by the Indian government, it's a very good 
to know and for a lot of people to hear that as well, that really there's been significant support that's been received over the years through Indian funding uh, agencies, Indian academia, and other global funding agencies as well. So anyway, we'll hear more about Chandi's story in, in a little bit. But I wanted to just uh, zoom out a little right now. And if we took uh, take a look at diagnostics as a whole, because really we're talking about diagnostics in the context of affordable diagnostics in India. And there's some very interesting trends happening. At the one end, all of us see that there are you know all of these app-based uh, systems coming in, which are promising very low-cost tests. So you have this highly centralized reference laboratories, very you know, nice uh, logistics supply chain tied in that's able to, at least in our cities, deliver very fast results at very low cost and so on. And then we all know that there's maybe half of our population that's completely underserved, that lacks access to even any rudimentary tests. So what is the solution to this? You know, is POCT point of care testing, which let's say we are all working on, is that really the solution to this? Or are these larger labs going to actually spread themselves over the country and actually provide better logistics? And could they also become solutions uh, to this? So maybe we'll, uh, I'll pause there and get both of your thoughts on that, that how do we meet the challenges really of the Indian diagnostics um, sector from a technology and science driven point? Yeah, uh, if I can just uh, say a couple of things here. Uh, I think it's a mix of both. Uh, that is what I strongly feel. Uh, you're right, you know, the bigger uh, diagnostics labs have now started uh, sample collections from far off, bringing them centrally, uh, you know, uh, the thyrocare is an excellent example, right? Uh, you know, they actually brought a new revolution in terms of provide, bringing down the cost in the conventional pathology uh, tests, right? But, you know, uh, I think one of the very important things also is the, the turnaround time, in my opinion. You know, that is where the point of care test will win over, at least in certain conditions. You know, COVID is an example. You know, Chandi is a true night, for example. You need the result instantaneously. You can't wait for the sample to go to a central lab and you know, results coming back after a, a day or a few hours. You know, the, the, as, as is said in healthcare, golden hour is extremely important to treat the patient, right? So I would imagine it's mix of both. And that is where there is there is a lot of, lot of uh, opportunity for point of care technologies. And if you talk about remote regions of the country, there is no dearth for it. I mean, you can't even bring samples from there, right? Uh, so that the point of care is the only way to uh, come uh, and make the healthcare affordable to them. That's my take. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, I completely second that thought. Um, I, I think it is going to be a mix of different kinds of technologies with different throughput point of care, low throughput technologies, um, medium throughput technologies for, let us say, a tire three setting um, uh, lab and high throughput uh, technologies for uh, the large labs. We have, as you said, Thyrocare is one example. There's a new example of uh, part kind labs that are setting up really in the tire two and tire three cities. So there is an expansion from those high throughput laboratories to nearer to care locations. And there is of course this entire point of care, um, real um, volume of technologies that is coming out in the point of care space that will address some of these needs. And together, I think the objective is to provide a very quick diagnosis to the patient, the diagnosis that is needed for clinical decision making and a very quick follow-on decision-making. The entire part, uh, thing is also tied in with information, some kind of electronic uh, health records, uh, a holistic view of health. And these are things that we are seeing today. So no one technology is going to really be the magic bullet. I think it is going to be a combination of multiple technologies that will allow us to address the key need, uh, that is to help people who are uh, ill recover very quickly. Got it, got it. You know, one thing that I find interesting always is that if you look, everyone talks about imports, how we're trying to reduce the dependency on imports and so on in India. If you look at the platform technologies in the central lab settings, they're dominated by the large companies that we all know about, the large multinational companies. But it seems like in point of care, it's a little bit more open that there is a chance 
to compete and where you don't have to go up against a Roche or an Abbott or Siemens or something straight out. Is that a criterion also for a company looking to enter the space that this is maybe an easier entry? Or do you also think that going to larger labs, building those kind of automated platforms uh, is also possible? Maybe Chandi, what, what, is, what do you think? So I think it is definitely possible. Um, the early generation of entrepreneurs um, have two challenges. One is access to technology. The other is access to funding. And if you're looking at automated platforms, if you can build on existing automation frameworks that exist a lot, and if you also have the kind of money power to be able to build it, there is no reason why a startup cannot build a high throughput platform. I don't think that that is the limitation. The uh, entire use case is driven by what somebody thinks as an entrepreneur is the use case they want to go after. What really motivates them? What do they see as the need gap? And uh, based on that, I think we take our individual decisions and I'm sure we should be able to address uh, even high throughput um, platforms if required given our current situation of funding and given our current state of understanding of technology or access to technology. Yeah, just uh, another important point here is that the uh, healthcare sector is extremely conservative. Unlike, let's say, consumer electronics, for example, you know, you bring in a new mobile phone, there are customers out there to buy it. Now, the problem with this uh, high throughput uh, diagnostics equipment, if one were to you know, do that, a startup, right? Who are your customers? These are big hospitals, right? Because only those hospitals can give you the high throughput uh, kind of load, right? So they, they will be extremely conservative. I mean, rightly so, I guess they're dealing with the human life. So, you know, the onus on the developer is phenomenal, you know? they will have to show that you know they are better than whatever gold or platinum standard and uh, you know uh, and also provide at it at the extremely low cost so i think the the barrier is little higher there you know whereas uh, you know as you quite rightly said uh, in point of care there aren't as many big players so barriers are a little lower i believe yeah sure sure and for those of us who attend trade shows you can see that over the last decade for example Chinese companies have gone from being a distant second and third to competing with the Biomerus and the Roches of the world, even in terms of these automated solutions. So clearly, they have made a big leap in the last 10 years. And you can see that in all the big, the big international trade shows. And, uh, you know, we're, I guess, hoping that India is not too far behind in those kinds of things happening. Just, just one point I want to make as an add-on. You're absolutely right. We can do it. But there is requirement of a government policy here. You mm -hmm. know, that is true even in point of care, you know, uh, asking the government departments to buy the point of care developed in India. Similarly, if an Indian company comes up with high throughput equipment, which is as good, there should be a government policy. This is what Chinese do extremely well. I think if we can come up with that, uh, then I think it would be phenomenal. Chandi, you want to say one something? One more thing is the deep, deep pockets that uh, uh, are required to do high throughput because most of the high throughput equipment are placed um uh, with a reagent rental model yeah and uh, most hospitals don't uh, um, don't really follow the reagent rental agreements very carefully right. so you have to have the pockets to sustain uh, that kind of a placement uh, that is another very big challenge that we uh, would face if we were to address that as a market individually sure sure okay we've spent a bit of time on this so maybe We'll move on to some other points now in the interest of time. I think uh, since both of you are innovators uh, coming from, you know, academic backgrounds, uh, you know, one of the things that our viewers would probably want to hear a little bit about is what is this path exactly involved? I know you spoke a little bit about it in your early slides, but let's say you have this path going from the, your first idea to actually a POC, uh, some sort of a proof of concept that works. And then, you know, from that stage to commercial scale, right? Like say, if we split it up into those two pieces and, you know, it's full of twists and turns, These, especially the early stages, you know, it's rarely proceeds in a very linear fashion as you, as, as you showed both of you in your slides, right? 
And one of my own favorite examples is the home pregnancy test. I don't know how many people know how it was actually made into a home pregnancy test that, uh, you know, chemists knew about 100 years ago that the hormone HCG was correlated with a positive pregnancy. And they used to check this by injecting a rabbit with the urine of a pregnant woman. And if the ovaries inflated after dissecting the rabbit, you could actually say that there was a positive pregnancy. You went from that to a woman who was a 26-year-old graphic designer who had no background in science or engineering, who made the first home test uh, for pregnancy back in the 1960s, right? So things come, I'm trying to say, from very different directions that none of us can even imagine. And today we all know the impact of that in terms of, let's say, the, probably one of the most widely used uh, point of care tests, right? So maybe if I start with you, Navkant, when you're thinking about it as an academic, right, how do you go from this user needs or whatever to, to this POC stage? And when do you say that a POC is actually done? When can you say that, yes, I have some reasonable confidence that this works at a proof of concept level? Yeah. Uh, so uh, firstly, you know, uh, when you are uh, looking at research in academia, right, you know, there is this famous uh, uh, pastures quadrant, uh, you know, that See, uh, you if you were to imagine x and y axis, right? You know, uh, wherein uh, uh, one of them is really utility, and the other axis is really you know your uh, fundamental knowledge, right? Uh, so, for example, uh, if you look at uh, Niels Bohr, I mean, he was just doing science just for the you know uh, excitement of it, right? There is no use-driven research per se, right? But whereas Pasteur was really doing things because he was really looking at some immediate requirement, the use and so on and so forth. And that's why we say, you know, Pasteur sort of represents this quadrant, which is use-driven research, which is, you know, top right quadrant, you know, which is also high on research and also very relevant in terms of the use, right? So I think researchers have to really step back and ask the questions, you know, do they have a right um, context for the research, right? One, of course, you keep doing research as the funds come in and, you know, but if you have the right context, if you're really looking at something that needs to be translated, then on day one, you put the boundary conditions exactly. What do you mean by that? I'll give an example, right? When I was starting on this, uh, you know, I had a PhD student and he said, oh, silicon MEMS is so exciting. Why don't we use silicon MEMS and start doing something, right? I said, no. If, if you want to do PhD, I don't want you to do, you know, silicon maps for uh, biomedical application, right? So, I mean, see, you can certainly do something in silicon maps and publish very well, but would that be really low cost and translatable? You know, that's a big question mark, right? I think we really have to have the right boundary conditions, right? You know, that is the first thing, right? And that's how we started our journey. We had the right boundary condition. We said, look, we want to do things which would be translatable. And everything you start looking at from that lens, right? So yeah. that is very important because once you go in a particular part too far and then say that, oh, I cannot translate it, then you have to come back to square one and you know get started on it, right? And when we did that, that's when we said, okay, you know, again, there are, there are two things. One is sensor, then the other is handled devices. Then of course there are apps, right? You can build apps, right? But our uh, notion was that the most important thing is really the sensor, right? The sensing chemistry and so on and so forth, right? Only when we got confidence in that, then we said, let's go to the next step. Let's start building the electronics. You know, Chandi made the statement, rest was really building the instrumentation, right? Although he said that, I think that itself is very, very challenging. <laughs> uh, so we, then we started looking at it, building the prototype. We, we actually went through multiple stages of prototypes, right? And then we had to interface with the users because we need to make sure that the user really uh, likes what you're doing, right? So again, it's going back and forth with the prototype given to the user, user giving you the feedback, right? So this is sort of a you know cyclical journey, right? That we had to go go through, and uh, you know eventually we came up with the prototype which was really deployable, right? I mean, of course, regulatory is completely different ball game. I think, let me not go into that. If I'm sorry to interrupt there, but now, Kant, how do you as an academic balance this publishability in, let's say, quote unquote, top journals versus actual needs on the ground, which may have nothing to do with those criteria, right? How do, 
how does one balance those things that certainly not easy it's difficult uh, uh, but but one thing uh, you know a lot of people in academia still uh, don't appreciate it is that they think that if you patent you can't publish which is completely incorrect right uh, you know uh, i tell my students you can even file a provisional patent and you can publish as well right and then you can do a detailed claims and all that later right so a lot of students have this uh, you know fear that if they start thinking about uh, translation and patents that phd gets delayed right you know we still have this mentality you know in india after phd they don't want to go in startups right although it is changing for good right now they want to go and join some company and so on and so forth so uh, it is hard but we can balance it fairly well you can file for provisional patent and can still publish we have also published our work in you know in few journals of course you know uh, you you said high impact journal that in itself is a different story you know some of these publication in high impact journal can take forever uh, so you will have to balance that as well where you want to publish because at the end of the day customers would also like to see has this been published you know uh, all yes. this is the tick marks for them right so it's hard yeah, right. but it can be done yeah. absolutely that's great and uh chandi if we move now to this next point right so navakant has given us the relay 90% of the work is done but we know that the next 10% takes 90% of the time and from uh, you know when we think it's almost there you know it's all, all seems to be working but then going from there to actually working in a customer location across multiple locations getting through regulatory barriers getting through manufacturing challenges etc i know this is like a, probably a thesis in itself but if you could summarize some of your learnings on this whole path that would be nice now i'll just start with your previous question in terms of when have you achieved poc and that was a very interesting question uh, to my mind because when we uh, after our initial uh, meandering set up uh, the path to uh, work on the pcr what we actually said is that we would create a device that would enable independent care that means we required something without infrastructure that required minimal training and that was low cost and if i reflect back i think that movement that we actually achieved a device or a platform that could go out and do testing at these point of care locations with some kind of a uh, sense of what it would cost and whether it could run independently that was i think the uh, poc situation for us but as an entrepreneur you want to gain uh, you want to take uh, small wins every time you get it so if an optical signal comes out noise free i think that was very major uh, achievement of proof of concept for us at that point in time so you you go with all of these small wins uh, if if your reaction worked that's that's great i mean from there when you finally come to that stage where you are able to deploy at a at a third party location and run your test and you are you are praying that it works and if it actually does work that is the i think the first step from there on uh, in our own case let us say um, we had multiple paths whether we were uh, we were to work with let us say a multinational company because we had some interest at that point in time or whether we wanted to build this ourselves and uh, very interestingly that is the time when i met sridam from uh, tulip diagnostics who had actually scaled um, lateral flow testing and they were i think the world's largest suppliers to all the programs uh, for uh, malaria etc that kind of scale was phenomenal and uh, that translation path was unknown to me at that point in time as a um, as a person working in this area that was the learning that kind of answers your question how do you take something at this scale and take it to international markets at scale first is the manufacturability of what you have and now we think about this up front but as an entrepreneur early entrepreneur i didn't think about it it was a question of how does this work not how do you make this in scale and achieve those cost principles that you talk about that is i think a very huge bottleneck 
if you just talk about the instrumentation, if you go to uh, an electronic manufacturing services player, that person wants a commitment in terms of volumes to be able to give you a, a something at a certain price point. How do you give volumes? Where is the question of giving volumes? You don't even know how many you're going to make, how many is required. So what is that ecosystem that is required to build at least reliable protos of your instrumentation is I think one part of the need gap. The other part of the need gap is your consumable. If you're talking about most POC devices are the razor and razor blade module, model because that is what makes business sense too. So your consumables are extremely low cost, but possibly pretty complex because that is what happens in POC. You take the complexity out of the instrument and put it into the consumable at many a time. So how do you actually scale these complex consumables to very large volumes and very low cost? Where is the technology to do that? And I think that is the other very, very major challenge that uh, we've had to think through. We've had to go through multiple iterations because ultimately when after regulation, you sit in front of a procurement agency, you will come up with all kinds of questions. In fact, I remember one very senior person asking me, what are you talking in dollars? No, you have to talk in rupees. You're an Indian company. Yes, I am an Indian company, but it takes much more to make these things in India than it takes to do this abroad because we simply don't have access to some of these things. So ultimately, it's going to come down to that. And therefore, design for manufacturing, uh, principles of manufacturing to scale and costs involved in that, I think, are a very major uh, uh, bottleneck that requires to be addressed. Regulatory is, again, something that is very interesting and is becoming more and more challenging, um, primarily because if you look at COVID, just as an example, you had to go to initially one institution in this country to get clearance. From there, you take that clearance to the CDS CEO and get uh, a license or an emergency use license. And then you start manufacturing. Along with that are a bunch of other licenses. Your premise has to be certified. They have to be certified under, under Factories Act. There's simply so much regulation around manufacturing a device. And if that regulation becomes more and more stringent, it just takes a long time to do this. And time is therefore money. It takes much more resources to do this uh, as time is progressing. We are becoming as complex or as stringent as some of the uh, the other international regulatory processes. We are, uh, I think our regulation today, the clinical part of it is pretty complex. And how do you access those clinical samples? How do you do those large numbers of validations ex expected out of this for public health, if you're talking about public health? Uh, and that's a, another question. What is your market? Is it private health markets or public health markets? If you do public health markets, I think the levels of validation expected are humongous. Okay, and this has to be multi-country uh, information that you collect, then global authorities to accept this. Post that is your procurement challenge. Who wants to kind of deploy your platform? Are we in a position where somebody wants to deploy this at scale still? Because a lot of time has passed. Has other technology come into play by that time? Then there is a challenge of how do you actually support distributed sites? Supporting, let us say, one site in a district headquarters is something. But if you have to support, say, thousand sites in a district, in a district it's a very different level of support. It's a very different level of uh, monitoring of those devices and um, ensuring a good user experience that is also a very critical part of this exercise. So just quick thoughts on this. These yeah. are the multiple challenges at least we have faced in our journey. Yeah. I mean, it's a, it's a lot of to information, in fact, to digest, Chandi, and maybe to just touch on one of those even. Uh, you know, when you have a 
really a deep tech ecosystem like the US or probably even China today, you can rely on a, a lot of your vendors to get things right, where you don't have to go and solve every one of your problems ab initio, correct? And it, in India, I think we all end up doing a lot more of that than necessary. Yes. So at least given where we are today, are you optimistic about, you know, the next five, 10 years, do you think we have more of a vendor system built out today that would make it easier going forward at least? Or can you talk about this a little bit? So I am seeing a lot of pull. See, ultimately, the vendor ecosystem comes from a pull uh, from our ecosystem. And that pull was missing. At least when we started out, there was nothing at all. So why would a vendor ecosystem develop at all, isn't it? But now, considering that there are so many technologies that have been incubated, that have reached uh, a level where they require prototypes, reliable prototypes to be developed. And um, there are a few of the technologies that are knocking at the doors of going to scale. I am seeing an improvement in the vendor ecosystem. It's very different from what it was a few years ago. So I'm very optimistic that over a period of time, we will reach there. But this will require uh, a lot of high level and uh, coordinated support from government agencies. That will require that those devices that have achieved a level of performance as required by programs are actually purchased by healthcare ecosystems. Unless you reach that, you will not get volumes. Unless you don't have uh, volumes, you're not going to get there. Sure. Yeah, thanks. Uh, and uh, on the... The clinical trial side, and we know there's all of these new rules now coming into place, which we aligned more with the CE system, for example. Uh, but if you have a new platform technology coming in, um, is there in your mind enough regulatory clarity today where you have combinations of instruments and consumables like many technologies do uh, to get that through our system? Because so far we've been regulating these as test kits. But now when you have this combination of instrument plus consumable, uh, in your mind, is there enough clarity on what that means for new platform technologies? I think that clarity is still emerging. Uh, I don't know whether there is complete clarity. And I think this is a learning process, both for the regulator as well as us. And uh, I think there is this, this desire now that we have to solve our own problems. And if that is the core desire, then I'm very hopeful that I think both the regulatory agencies as well as uh, the companies will work together. It's going to be a painful transition, but I think uh, at the end of it, we will come out pretty okay. Yeah. And Navkant, you want to... Yeah. yeah, yeah. I just wanted to mention, you know, it's absolutely okay to have, uh, you know, regulatory guidelines and all that, but the perception of the regulatory agencies is what is important. In the US, FDA works in collaboration with developers. There is... Uh, it's It completely you know, changes the, the way things happen, right? As opposed to a regulatory agency trying to police, you know, a developer, right? So I, I would hope and I would like to see this in our country that our regulatory agencies uh, collaboratively work with the developers to bring in new, lot of Indian technologies, you know, uh, solutions in healthcare. It is just the perception that needs to change in my opinion. Yeah, absolutely. And I believe, you know, CDSCO is also significantly expanding their teams and so on. So, uh, and I, their entire process is online, as you know, today. So I think things have certainly gotten significantly better. And hopefully this collaborative spirit is what we will see going forward as well, especially because many of these new complex technologies are not going to get past the regulator without that collaborative. There's no predicate device for these. <laughs> yes, absolutely. There's got to be a lot That's of... usually the biggest problem. Yes, yes. Yeah. Exactly. So uh, we're coming up close to an hour now. So I thought uh, we'll do one last thing, which is maybe both of you, because there's a lot of young people today looking at starting companies and I know especially diagnostics has attracted a lot of interest from funding agencies. Many people have started companies in point of care diagnostics and so on. Many of them listening in today, probably many more will listen in once the link goes up on YouTube. And every path is different. We know that. But any sort of high level learnings that you both would like to summarize, you know, for people that want to emulate your paths and want to get to where you people are today? 
Uh, well, uh, you know, one thing that I have started uh, since, uh, you know, I took sabbatical leave to get this startup, uh, you know, in place in 2015, I spent a year and when I came back, after that, I started teaching a course on entrepreneurship, right? Now, the interest in this course is uh, increasing year on year. Uh, you know, this, this year I'm teaching, there are uh, 80 students from UG, MTech, all the way to PhD, right? So, so one thing that I tell the students is that, you know, you got to be very passionate, you know, it's not, uh, you know, nine to five job uh, that you're going to start a company, you know, it becomes your life, right? Only, only if you're into it, you, you start a company, right? And it, you have to enjoy the journey, you know, whether, you know, you, you become a unicorn or, you know, you will have to fold that and start a new company, which is very common in the US, it's so be it, right? Uh, so uh, I think one has to be extremely passionate and there's a lot of support system available. It can be better. So this is where I thought I will just share one slide uh, just for all our uh, universities, IIC, IITs to be, uh, you know, to aspire for. So I thought I'll just uh, share this one uh, important statistics, which was published uh, in 2020 by Stanford. Uh, I think you can uh, see this slide, I hope. Uh, Yes. Right. They had completed 50 years of their Office of Technology license, right? They, it started in 1970, by the way. In 2020, they have come up with this very nice statistics. You know, this is a, a document. I've just taken this one small item from that document. So, over 50 years, the university has generated a staggering 2 billion revenue, right? That's unimaginable here, right? Okay. And, you know, some of these numbers are very, very interesting. 415 startups that came out you know, 11, more than 11,000 inventors and so on and so forth. Uh, but one very important thing I want to uh, mention here in the context of today's discussion, if you look at the top five blockbuster inventions, which are really brought in uh, a phenomenal uh, revenue, one would have thought it's going to be only in computer science and, uh, you know, engineering. But only one of them, which is the page rank algorithm, which is Google, by the way, is right. in uh, computer science. Rest four are really in healthcare. Wow. Well, the antibodies, recombinant DNA, CD47, cancer immunotherapy, trans transcription mediated, uh, you know, uh, amplification. This is, by the way, isothermal amplification, which also uh, was very, very crucial for COVID. All the four out of five are in healthcare, right? There's a lot of opportunities. And I think this is the kind of innovation system that we really want to build here in India you know, uh, hopefully it will happen in the next decade or two, right? That is quite eye-opening, actually, you know, something that I would never have guessed before you showed that slide, that other, that I thought it would have been dominated by Google. So it is definitely heartening to see that, um, you know, that there is so much potential in, in healthcare. And and Chandi, from from your side, uh, you know, any summary? So I... I... Yeah. yeah, I believe that you have to, I second what uh, Navkant has said, you have to be very passionate. So uh, entrepreneurship is not for everybody. If you're getting into entrepreneurship because you think you can build a unicorn, I think you should not get into entrepreneurship because it will affect your health very badly. <laughs> it's not going to happen that easily. If you are uh, passionate about impact, and that is what I think healthcare is about to a very large extent, then every single step that you can take towards providing a solution and providing that impact is going to give you a tremendous amount of satisfaction. The other thing that I believe is that you should not listen to anybody. If you are convinced about what you want to do, then whoever be the, uh, the superstar who is telling you that, okay, you should not do it. I don't think you should listen because I, that is what is your uniqueness, isn't it? Unique solutions is what really scale, isn't it? So why listen to anybody else? And if it, that person knew everything about the unique solution that you're talking about, then why would you not have that solution already? So if you're passionate about something, I think you should follow it. Every path is unique. And I, I'm very, very, uh, uh, I'm a very strong believer in this now that there are different ways that you can approach a problem, but every path is unique. If you're passionate about a path, an entrepreneur should follow it and everything else will follow. Absolutely. I've seen this in our own journey. 
uh, that if you're very passionate about what you want to achieve, support will come in some form from somewhere. At least that has been uh, our case when when the night appears the darkest. That is when you will suddenly see a ray of hope from somewhere. It's only about passion and the dedication to follow the path that you set out for yourself. And that is what I would suggest uh, that people should do. Excellent. I think... Uh very important pieces of advice from people that have achieved a lot. So uh, that's it's great to hear this. And I think, you know, in some sense, it's also fair to say that the path forward in terms of support is going to be is a little easier than it was, let's say, 20 years ago or when, you know, uh, you started out and Navkan started out at ISC. It's going to be a little easier, at least in terms of getting access to your first check for $100,000 or a half a million dollars even today. Uh, and in that sense, um, it may be easier for people to follow uh, their dreams a little bit. And, you know, this is also an IIT Alumni Association uh, co-host, right? And I think one of the challenges that we see in the life sciences sector is traditionally salaries are significantly lower than, let's say, developers and so on. And a place like Bangalore, in fact, that difference is very stark. Uh, and, you know, so for people with those kinds of backgrounds, you know, if you're an IIT alum and you feel you want to do this, stuff you want to get into healthcare life sciences innovation uh, but like you know how, how important are considerations like that i think it is a hard journey and uh, if you're looking at a salary check please go and join a tech company uh, that will give you peace of mind possibly there there in our own cases there have been months without any visibility of a paycheck. Okay, and uh, this is not what I, I want to tell entrepreneurs. I want to tell them that there is some light at the end of the tunnel. Don't worry about this. We will, we will, you know, that is the best way of looking at this entire uh, journey. Yeah. The focus on paycheck can be very distracting. Your sure. focus will be to provide a paycheck to so many other people who are working for you. That is what will consume most of your time, not the technology, not the science, nothing else. Well said, well said. And um, I hope uh, these inspirational words will serve to ignite many more entrepreneurial journeys going forward. So now, uh, having heard all of this exciting stuff, let's move a little bit to the audience. And there's several questions that have come in. So I will come to them one by one. In fact, let's start with maybe Bhavna's question. And in fact, this is about, this is a very interesting one, actually. Her question is, is POC, point of care testing, more affordable than the at-home testing, I, which by which I mean, I think she means the at-home sample collection and then sent to a reference lab testing. How would it be, how would it help India's large non-metro population? Um, so, you know, is, you know, POC testing, more affordable than reference lab testing. You know, the question that comes up very often is almost sort of anti-intuitive in the Western context. But then in India, this question is actually asked. So what, what, how would you respond to that? I think POC testing can never be as cost-effective as centralized lab testing. And there is something to be said about integrating those scales in a centralized lab where you can reduce the complexity of the consumable and run these at much lower costs. But then that cost is measured in terms of money. What about the cost in terms of a missed opportunity to diagnose right then and there? What about the cost of recovery? So I don't think it is about the cost. It is not about the affordability of the test also. It is about the impact of the test. You can have the cheapest test but if that test does not have an impact, there is no point doing that test. If you have the opportunity to diagnose somebody much earlier in the infection cycle or in the, uh, in the case of chronic diseases at uh, critical times, that one, the, those few minutes can make a tremendous difference to that life. And if you can't impact that life, then what is cost? So I think a lot of people are looking at POC and talking about cost, comparing it to centralized lab testing. I think we have to understand what we are going after. 
Uh, it's not just, the monetary cost alone. Yeah, I just want to add one more thing here. The cost depends on how you look at it, right? As Chandi said, if your intent is to do 10,000 tests, obviously, you know, the centralized lab will work out much better. But if your intent is to do 10 tests in a village, right, that 10 tests, you know, in a village will be extremely cost efficient using POC, right? Now, whether it would also be applicable for metro, well, case in point is glucometers, right? Now, glucometers are, tests are done at home, right? I mean, those are much cheaper than a person going to a pathology lab and although pathology lab can do 10,000 glucose tests in a jiffy, right? That's not very efficient because there's a lost time and so on and so forth. So I think the context is very important here, right? In certain contexts, POC is cost effective. In other cases, the central lab will be cost effective. Sure. Uh, next question from Kiran Raj. Question to Dr. Navkan But How do you think the opportunities in places like the IITs for early career researchers and faculties support entrepreneurial ventures? How far are we from attaining such levels of output in terms of startups compared to globally renowned institutions like MIT, et cetera? That's a good question. I already showed you an example from Stanford, you know, the, the kind of output that has come in. Uh, we have a long way to go, but things are moving in the right direction. As an example, uh, you know, for example, if either a faculty or student wants to start a company today in IAC or even IITs, I think almost all institutes have started this, right? Uh, they can, uh, uh, you know, take one day in a week Officially, one day in a week, they can work on the company, right? They're still on the roles of the institute, on the university. They get full salary, but one day, one day in a week, you can work on the company, right? Which was not possible earlier, right? You know, this change has come in in the last five to 10 years, right? Similarly, you know, students as well, you know, if you want to start a company in most of the places, give a seed fund. Right? This is not going to you know, angel investors and getting funds. Right, The universities have a, have a program today which uh, help you fund uh, maybe 10, 15, 20 lakh, whatever it is. Right, So that has also started. And they also give you a space. So you don't have to worry finding a space for your company. Right, So a lot of these interventions have started. But what needs to happen is really you know, a closer dialogue with other stakeholders. Right? other industries and universities coming together and talking to each other on a continuous basis. All this has to happen, but things are moving in the right direction. If I may uh, just add something to that, I think uh, we've spent a lot of time and energy in this country trying to nurture innovation and that has shown uh, all, uh, lovely results, I think, uh, so far. But we have to go beyond nurturing innovation. We have to now nurture path to scale. I don't see any effort in that area at all. For example, I don't even know whether funding agencies realize what is the cost of maintaining IP internationally. Where is the support for that? What about the the, the ability to go and build your first, uh, say, 100,000 consumables or 10,000 consumables? Where is the support? Unless you get to, and I saw a question on venture capital also, Unless you get to showing some kind of an impact, how are you going to attract value in terms of getting your follow-on funding? So where is this going to come from? These are questions I think that our entire innovation ecosystem has to start thinking about a little more. No, yeah, absolutely. And on that point, this is Ashok's question here, Ashok Mishra's question, that yes, there is a sort of a gap here. VCs are looking for promising healthcare startups. Everyone knows that there's going to be a lot of big healthcare companies coming out of India, let's say in the coming years. But when it comes to passing information from these science and technology driven companies, a lot of VCs maybe are also not equipped to kind of deal with all this science driven valuation effectively, right? A lot of your IP, your pre-revenue is driven, all your value is driven by IP. So how does one build that bridge a little bit better? Are there some green shoots there in terms of people making those connections? Andy, you want to take so, that? Uh, yeah, so uh, I think this is the problem. We see the VC, VC ecosystem is still, I think, a little better equipped 
to understand a little bit of science. But the VK, VC ecosystem is not looking at the science that has gone into the uh, the technologies and or the technology that has gone into the product. It's looking at whether that product can make money. So the risk is how do you translate this effectively to a stage where you can make money out of technology? When you go to the PE ecosystem, it is completely about the money. They don't need to understand your science. So I think it is the entrepreneur's job to ensure that the risk associated in go-to-market is addressed. As you can address that risk, your VC money will come in. I don't think that that is the issue. But as entrepreneurs, uh, tech, technopreneurs, I think, tend to te be very, very involved with technology. And they start wondering why they are not getting the support. It's not about the technology anymore. I think that is the job of the entrepreneur to ensure that the technology risk is taken care of. And the VC is talking to you because he believes that you have taken care of the technology risk. It is the market risk that we have to address. Once we address that, we will start seeing more investments in both the VC and the PE space. Agreed. <clears throat> uh, next question, Raghu Murthy. Uh, why, why do materials always turn out to be the first important cog in the innovation wheel for biomedical devices? Is it only because of cost principles involved in large-scale manufacturability? I think in general, materials are a very important aspect in any systems, right? <laughs> Not just in biomedical system, right? You know, the raw materials and consumables play an extremely important role. Uh, and, you know, just as in point of care testing as well, you know, you, you, need, you need to, if you're building an immunoassay, right? You know, uh, then you need the right uh, antibodies or antigens, right? You know, when COVID happened, everything had to be imported, right? So that is just one example, right? There are many, then today for any handheld device or anything that you want to make in biomedical, there's a huge chip shortage, right? That is also, you know, raw material, right? I mean, if you don't have chip, the problem is that we don't have any of these manufacturing ecosystem in the country, as Chandi already pointed out. If it was there, then it would not become a bottleneck. Materials are crucial for everything, but we need to have these manufacturing ecosystem in the country. Yeah, absolutely. <clears throat> and uh, there have I been... Material... Of... Sorry. Sorry, yeah. Dhananjay. One other part is that it is not just cost and manufacturability. It is also social impact. Today, we have this tremendous focus on the consumable that is coming out from the medical uh, diagnostic that you are uh, running. What is the environmental impact of that. And it is not going to be a question that will be pushed away too long. I think there is a tremendous focus to ensure that your environmental footprint is low even in these technologies. So everything uh, as, a, as a complete package is all pointing to materials. The scalability, the cost, the environmental impact, all of these will be pointing to materials. It's going to be the most Critical area. Yeah, maybe Dhananjay can talk about fabric based sensor that he had pioneered, right? Absolutely, yeah. Dhananjay, <laughs> yes. <laughs> no, it's true. I think, uh, you know, things that are biodegradable, I think there's even a lot of interesting work in biodegradable polymers and plastics, which can be injection molded. And certainly these are very relevant topics for the future because we are creating a lot of plastic waste. There is no doubt about it. And, uh, you know, addressing that with different technologies is going to be an important challenge for the future. I think there's been a lot of core platform technologies, including this fabric thing that we've worked on, there's paper microfluidics and so on. Uh, so it, I think we'll see some interesting developments in that in the coming years. Uh, I missed one question early on, Vijay Srirangan. Have you seen experimentally the use of drones for sample collection and movement to a central site in India anywhere? Well, I have not seen that, uh, Chandi. Uh, yeah. No, neither have I, not yet. But I think it is definitely doable. Um, there is no reason why we should not be attempting some of these things also. Um, I think that is a that's an entrepreneurial um, um, opportunity right there. Absolutely. <laughs> Absolutely. And I think there is enough use cases in India 
uh, where he, whether it's in fact even vaccine delivery or uh, diagnostics and so on, there are lots of remote parts of India that are very difficult to access. And we hear all these stories about people trekking for two days to reach some remote community and so on. You know, so I think uh, lots of opportunities yes. there for sure. Okay, so ha, huh. Raj, what are the three biggest challenges today biomed startups face in India? So biomed is now a pretty big area. We'll maybe restrict ourselves to diagnostics. So what are the three challenges that diagnostics uh, startups face in India today? I think right. we've gone through uh, some of these quite a bit. Uh, yeah. But uh, maybe, okay, now come, go ahead, please. Yeah, so one, of course, is the supply chain. Uh, that, I think, is very, very crucial. Uh, a lot of us have gone through this pain. You know, that is number one for me. <laughs> then, of course, regulatory, it could be better. Uh, that is another challenge. Uh, uh, then, you know, um, policies of the government, right? You know, I think uh, we need... Uh, more uh, policies uh, which are favorable for startups in terms of procurement. So these are the three things. Okay, thank you. And question for Dr. Nair, Chandi, could you talk about challenges in scaling revenues 20X in one financial year? Somebody has been looking up your financials. <laughs> they have to also look up that we've been around for 22 years. So <laughs> I think... Um, it is the the readiness of the technology, and that is what I think all of us have to work on. Uh, if the technology is ready for scaling, and if all of those manufacturing uh, details are taken care of, if your supply chain is addressed, if your market and your ability to deliver to that market is addressed, then any company can scale. So it is about prepared, uh, being prepared and nothing else, I think. It's not, it's not magic. It is not as if there was an opportunity and we scaled to 20x. It is not possible to do that unless all of those uh, things are put in perspective. Now, I think it's a very important point Chandi makes here that, you know, fortune favors the prepared mind, as they say. It is not like they woke up one day and decided to start doing a COVID PCR test. You know, a lot of people did that, of course, because it was a big problem. But then... You have to have had a platform and development, gone through these validation cycles, manufacturing, regulatory. And then, you know, something like this comes along. And I think similarly, the case with the person who made the first PCR test sitting out of home in Germany, right? He does that, I believe, for every new virus that comes out. You know, 99 out of 100, nobody even knows about what those are. But when COVID happened, he, he, he was the only, only one that had a test available for the first two months or something. So, yes, definitely being prepared is most important here. Okay, so I think uh, we have no more questions from the audience. Uh, Sushila or Narayan, do you people want to uh, say anything at this point? What do you think we should do? Yeah, so Sushila, can you go ahead? Yeah, Dhananjay, maybe a little bit of your journey as well would be interesting. No, I'm, I'm the moderator, so <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, well, uh, you know, briefly, I'm also in point of care in the space of point of care diagnostics, and Achira has done uh, has built out actually two different platforms. One is this fabric based diagnostics that uh, Chandi and Navkant spoke about, where we have built effectively the world's first woven fabric based platform to build sensors, and that actually uses weaving, which is uh, infrastructure that's av widely available in India. So you can build different kinds of sensors using fabric. Uh, the other technology that we are building is actually uh, a multiplex molecular, uh, sorry, multiplex immunoassay technology uh, to do uh, different immunoassays, which are protein-based assays. Uh, so things like tropical fever panels and so on are done from the same sample. So the idea is to use a microfluidic technology to do several different tests at the same time. Uh, so we are uh, doing that. And Achira recently got supported by CIPLA to actually take some of these innovations to market at scale. Great, thank you. <clears throat> so uh, let me let me start by thanking uh, Professor Navkan Bhatt, Chandi, and Dhananjay for uh, this very in interesting session today. You know, when, when I was looking at the 
uh, the sustainable development goals and kind of just looked at which of those goals was impacted in some manner by uh, health, just, just the, the idea of good health, at least 10 of them are directly related to good health. And uh, therefore, you know, the importance of today's discussion, especially for a country like ours, uh, is very high. I, I want to start from there, but, uh, you know, just, just to kind of uh, wrap up what we went through today, we started with two very nice, uh, very interesting stories. The story of uh, Professor Navkant Bhatt and the story of Dr. Chandrasekhar Nair as they built up their uh, companies. <clears throat> so Navkant's story showed us the importance of in interdisciplinary work and the importance of collaboration. And throughout our webinars over the last uh, you know, many months, we've heard these themes come up repeatedly. So. Uh, I think, again, today's uh, stories, both both uh, Chandi and Navkan, both their stories, again, underlined the, the importance of these aspects. Um, then, uh, you know, he went on to talk about uh, global trends and how various pieces of technology and different aspects are coming together. Things like AI, ML, which we thought was, you know, something different and nanotech, molecular bio, biology, chemistry, medical science, all of them are really coming together. And from there, he went on to talk about uh, the importance of having uh, all of these in the academic setting under one umbrella. And, and we saw uh, you know, a, a very strong case from, from uh, global examples. And uh, so IAC has announced uh, the hospital that is coming up. And I believe a couple of IITs have also announced that they're going to be having centers for medical uh, studies. And, uh, <clears throat> and then we also saw, uh, you know, because of that collaboration and the fact that all of these uh, collaborations were possible, we looked at some uh, completely transformatory uh, innovations that came out of this and what they did for medical science and human life as a as a result of, of that, those collaborations and innovations. And finally, the support for entrepreneurship within the universities, which we are seeing happen uh, here also. Chandi talked about uh, te technology design and the importance of making sure that the product was is marketable right at the beginning. Uh, how uh, to, to make sure that um, you know, what you're designing is designed for the market and is not an afterthought. Uh, the importance again of academia and industry collaboration, um, the importance of making, uh, or the, the, uh, the effort that goes into making an interdisciplinary team work together. Uh, I, I thought that was a very important point, Shandy, that you brought up. And, and then of course, there were many challenges that he talked about and um, of the importance of biosafety as you think about uh, building up a, a point of care devices, device. And uh, also from an operations perspective, uh, how, uh, you know, you've got to think end to end solution. And, and it's, again, it's not something that you think about piece to piece. So a lot of things have to go into the design phase itself. And a result of all of this thinking is the single box in which uh, prep, PCR, and printer, all of them come together. And for me, that is, a, uh, that is a brilliant example of what a point of care diagnostic tool should look like uh, for a country like India, which, which, is, which is really the theme of today's discussion as well. <clears throat> we, we talked then, we went on to talk about diagnostics as a whole. And uh, you know many aspects throughout the discussion, including uh, the discussions around questions that were raised by our uh, audience. Uh, many points came up, such such as with our large rural population, what can we do? Uh, the 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 uh, combination of low throughput, medium throughput, high throughput diagnostics, and how all of these have a very important role to play for for us. Um, how. I think it was also very important to, to ask the question, why are we doing diagnostics? And, and really that is about helping a sick person recover very fast. And once you put it that way, your definition of what impact is also ties up to that aspect. 
So therefore, it is not about how many samples you process, but how much of an impact you make even to that one life. <clears throat> and uh, then we talked about how many new business opportunities are there around the idea of point of care and about uh, of diagnostics spread across a country like ours. And, and the idea of the drone, for example, was, was uh, something that came up at that point of time. But clearly there are, even through the ecosystem, there are still many, many uh, areas with huge amount of opportunity, which, which was something that came up in today's discussion. Uh, we went on to look at the ecosystem itself and uh, what kind of ecosystem you need to be able to build a, a reliable prototype, to think manufacturability early enough, Think about scaling and where the different pieces of technology lie, how they come together, regulatory approvals, uh, and uh, you know, and how everyone needs to, everyone who's impacted, who has a role to play, needs to work together to address some of the gaps that really exist and are uh, impeding uh, the, the fast scaling of the innovations that are going on. <clears throat> Um, and then there was discussion around uh, regulators as well, and, and the, the, the need for the regulator to shift from being somebody who polices to someone who works collaboratively with those who are developing. So then we uh, finally, we looked at what does entrepreneurship require? And, uh, you know, both our speakers brought, brought out some very uh, important points. Uh, the one thing is very clear that you can get lots and lots of satisfaction out of doing something uh, impactful, but it starts with passion and passion for impact, uh, not for uh, dollars. And, and um, again, does bioscience, does uh, healthcare have an opportunity for doing something tremendous? If you went back to Stanford's top five blockbusters in the last over the past 50 years, four of them were in healthcare. So uh, yeah, I thought uh, Navkant really passionately called out the opportunity for those who are looking at working in this space that, that there is so much to be done and so much to be achieved. Uh, again, uh, Chandi said, don't listen to everyone, follow your heart and follow your own unique path. There are many different ways of solving a problem. Once you know and you're convinced of your path, just follow it. Dhananjay kind of exemplified that when he talked about what Achira has been doing. And we heard him in, in an earlier webinar as well. <clears throat> so, um, you know, in conclusion, when, when Jeffrey Sachs, for example, in, in his book, The End of Poverty, in his section on the impact of science for development, I think the very first point that he mentions there is addressing disease. And um, why, you know, that itself tells us why we need to focus on healthcare as a segment in, as part of our overall uh, development and, and our dream of, of chasing the 5 trillion economy. And um, so therefore, I think today's discussion uh, was very relevant and extremely thought provoking. I hope it's been able to uh, inspire a lot of people uh, who are looking to working in this space. And we hope to see many, many more innovations and, and much more happening in this space in the years to come. With that, once more, thank you all. Thanks to all of our audience for being here and for participating. This webinar will go up on, our, on the IIT ACB YouTube channel and you will find it there. Please feel free to share it with anyone who you think would uh, benefit from it. And of course, to our speakers, Professor Navkanbhat and Dr. Chandshekhar Nair, thank you ever so much for taking the time to be here. Chandi, you are in the US. Thank you for you know uh, <laughs> an early rise just to be with us on this webinar. And Dhananjay, thanks as always for doing a wonderful job of, uh, of uh, pulling this whole webinar together. With that, thank you again and good night.